Welcome to our worship service on this holiday weekend. It's good to see you all here on a beautiful, fresh new day after a nice rain. Um, today is the last opportunity that you are going to have to sign up, to have your picture taken for our new pictorial church directory. Last opportunity today. It's off the website already. Um, they're going to be in 
the fellowship hall after the service and you can make an appointment, but we sure want to have everybody involved in this, everyone's picture in our family directory. So take a moment to do that. It only takes a few minutes to have your picture taken. They're very helpful, very cooperative. They're not pushy afterwards. Sure, they want to sell you some pictures, but they're not pushy afterwards, and it, it, it'll just take a few minutes of your time. And this week, Tuesday through Saturday, I think, is the last picture-taking sessions that they're going to have. So please take a moment today to sign up for one of those pictures. Uh, also, I just want to say thank you and recognize that yesterday morning, um, 15 guys from our church uh, put on a new roof for an elderly member of our congregation who's uh, homebound. The roof really needed to be replaced. And uh, those 15 guys got together, made it happen. A couple of ladies in the church gave them some refreshments halfway through the morning, and, and it was a job well done. I arrived just after it was finished. I'm sorry for that, but it, uh, I did have a donut. It was, uh, they did a good job. And we really appreciate that kind of a thing. And then also, I just want to emphasize that uh, September 11 is a very important date, a memorable date in the life, in the history of our country. You know, the attack, the terrorist attack on the Twin Towers in New York City. And um, a day of prayer and repentance is being called for this year on September 11. And we're challenging the members of our congregation to set aside a half hour during September 11 from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. to spend a half hour in prayer. Would you please sign up for a half hour? Uh, we've got a prayer list, a sheet, a suggestion sheet that'll kind of guide you through that time of prayer. And if you can find a half hour where you can get alone and just call out to God on behalf of the United States of America and the troubled world in which we are living, um, you know, the Lord says to us, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, we need to do this. Now we need to do this. So there's sign-up sheets all over the church. Just look for one. There's a, a, a prayer sheet there for you to pick up, and we hope that you take advantage of that today. Okay. Um, it's always a blessing on the first Sunday of the month to welcome new members by profession of faith and to celebrate the sacrament of infant baptism and we have the uh, privilege of doing that again this morning. Casey Grace Wolver was born to Corey and Stacy Wolver this year and uh, they came and requested baptism for her. This is their third child, a son and now two daughters and we just rejoice in God's goodness in their life. Uh, Corey and Stacy are very faithful. They're here every Sunday. I, in fact, I see an empty pew out there. Someone respects them, and they, that's where they usually sit back there, and it's empty. Um, they, are, they attend Sunday school, and uh, we're, we're just thankful for you guys' faithfulness to the Lord and to his church. This is what we understand by baptism, and this is why we practice infant baptism. Hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, who said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The Bible tells us that we are a covenant people, and God first made this covenant with Abraham. And this is what he said. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. I will be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Now, we are not the biological descendants of Abraham. So how does this covenant apply to us? Well, the Apostle Paul tells us that we are members of this same covenant, participate in this same covenant through faith in Jesus Christ. He writes, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs of the promise. And then the Apostle Peter puts it this way. He says, this promise is for you and your children, for all who are far off all whom the Lord our God will call. 
Baptism is the sign and seal of God's promises to his covenant people. The sign of that covenant in the Old Testament was circumcision, administered to little boys who were eight days old. That sign involved the shedding of their blood. However, because Jesus shed his blood on the cross, God's covenant no longer needs a bloody sign. So the sign of the covenant today is water, applied to both boys and girls at their baptism. Just as water cleanses our bodies, water baptism symbolizes our cleansing through the blood of Christ. Water cleanses, purifies, refreshes, and sustains. And Jesus is often referred to in the Bible as the living water. In baptism, God promises by grace to work in the lives of our children, to draw them to faith in his Son, to forgive their sins when they trust in him, and to adopt them into the body of Christ, his church. And God also promises to send his Holy Spirit into their lives, to renew them. And someday, God promises, I will raise them to eternal life. Through baptism, Christ calls us and our children to a new obedience, to love and trust God completely, to forsake the evil of this world, and to live in a new and holy life. Because of our sinful nature, we will fall from time to time into sin. But we must not despair of God's mercy, nor continue in sin. For baptism is the sign and seal of God's eternal covenant of grace with us. Well, Corey and Stacy, I'd like to ask you to stand. You stand before us having brought your daughter, Casey Grace Wolber, to receive the sacrament of baptism. Therefore, before God and Christ Church, I ask you to answer sincerely to the following questions. Do you reaffirm your faith in Jesus Christ and renounce sin and the power of sin in your life and in the world? Who is your Lord and Savior? Will you be faithful members of Christ's church and through worship and service seek to advance God's purposes here and throughout the world? You promise to instruct Grace, Casey Grace in the truth of God's word and in the way of salvation through Jesus Christ. You promise to pray for her and teach her to pray. You promise to train her in Christ's way by your own personal example through worship together in Christ's church and through Christian education at home and in the church. I'd like to ask the members of this congregation and their Christian family members if they would stand also with them. And I ask you, do you, the members of this congregation and Christian family members, promise to love, encourage, and support these parents, Corey and Stacy Wolber, as they seek to raise their daughter in the Christian faith. You promise to pray for Casey Grace, teaching her the gospel of God's love, being an example of Christian faith and character, and by giving the strong support of God's family, which is the church. This is your desire. Please respond by saying, we do, and we ask God to help us. You may be seated. Let me introduce to you Casey Grace Wolver. She was born on July 1st of this year to Corey and Stacy. She has a big brother, Ethan. Ethan is four. Ethan, are you four? Yeah, okay. And she has a sister, Jory. 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 How old are you, Jory? How old are you, Jory? Jory, how old are you? Oh, see, she can answer. You did good, though. You're the big brother, aren't you? Yeah. yeah. Grandparents are here today. We're happy to have them here. Bill and Catherine Wolber, this is their eighth grandchild. Jerry and Deb uh, Verhoof, their ninth grandchild. And even great-grandma, uh, Jolene Hoffmeyer. 
Well, let's baptize Casey. Casey, grace. It was for you, little one, that Jesus came into the world. It was for you that he suffered and died. And it was for you that he rose again from the dead. All this he did for you, Casey, even before you knew it. Casey, Grace, Wolber, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for this beautiful family. We thank you for blessing this couple with three healthy, alert, happy, energetic children. We thank you for Corey and Stacy that it's important to them to raise their children in this faith, to pass on to them the promises that they've believed all their lives. We pray that you will help us all as we seek to support this couple and their children. Help us all to grow in the faith, to support each other, to pray for each other, to teach and encourage each other. Thank you for this wonderful sacrament which gives us your promise, I will be a God to you and to your children after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Corey, congratulations. Stacy, congratulations to you. Our boy, Ethan. Jory, congratulations. Yes. Gary D. Hogue is going to present you with Casey's baptism certificate. Thank you very much. You may be seated. Oh, we praise God for his goodness in your lives and in ours. She's an upfront person, isn't she? <laughs> Must be the Verhoof side. And I am very happy to introduce to you Robbie Thompson. Robbie um, is, has lived in Sheldon for some time. He's been coming to First Reformed Church for quite a while. Um, he used to sit way in the back with Rob and Sharla. Look at him today. He's in the front row of the church. Um, the elders of First Reformed Church have welcomed Robbie, who came before us to make profession of his faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. In making his public profession of faith in Jesus Christ, Robbie affirms the meaning of his baptism. He, too, was baptized as an infant. And the promise is this, that God is faithful to his covenant promises. Psalm 89 says this, I will sing of the Lord's great love forever. With my mouth I will make your faithfulness known through all generations. I will declare that your love stands firm forever, that you established your faithfulness in heaven itself. You said, I have made a covenant with my chosen one. I have sworn to David, my servant. I will establish your line forever and make your throne firm through all generations. I will maintain my love to him forever and my covenant with him will never fail. If his sons forsake my law and do not follow my statutes, if they violate my decrees and fail to keep my commands, I will punish their sin with the rod, their iniquity with flogging. But I will not take my love from him nor will I ever betray my faithfulness, because I will not violate my covenant or alter what my lips have uttered. God has demonstrated this covenant faithfulness in the life of Robbie Thompson. Robbie, we're going to ask you to stand now and confess your faith before the church and before the Lord himself. In the privacy of your own prayers, you've accepted Jesus as your Savior and asked him to come into your life, and we're simply going to ask you to do that publicly in front of this family that is going to be your family in Christ. Robbie, I charge you before God and Christ's church to reject sin and evil, to profess your faith, and to commit yourself to ministry and service in Christ's church. So, do you renounce sin and the power of sin in your life in the world? Who is your Savior and Lord? Do you promise to respond to Christ's salvation by cooperating with the work of God's Spirit in your life and by giving your best effort 
to live a life of grateful obedience to God from this day forward. Do you make that promise? You promise to be a faithful member of the church of Jesus Christ, and through worship and service, will you seek to do your best to advance God's purposes in his church, in this community, and throughout the world? You promise to live in a spirit of love and patience, seeking to fulfill the commands of Jesus, who said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Do you make that promise? And finally, do you promise to submit yourself to the care and love of Christ's church as it seeks to nurture you in the faith and lead you to maturity in Christ? I'd like to ask Robbie's new congregational family to stand with him, please. You know, um, Robbie has no family in this area. Um, he has not much contact with his family we're going to be his family. There have been people that have already been uh, a family to Rob. Uh, Rob and Sharla uh, Roseboom, Aaron and Sherry Bootsma, Gary and Nadine DeHogue. They've been very supportive. Kept in contact with Robbie when he was in prison recently. And uh, he's got a small group of support. But he needs us all. So I ask you, do you welcome Robbie Thompson into the community of faith and pledge to him your love, your prayers, your encouragement, and your support as he seeks to live his Christian life among us? And if this is your pledge and desire, please respond by saying, we do, and we ask God to help us. Then, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I declare that Robbie Thompson is received into the communicant membership of the church and entitled to all the blessings, privileges, and responsibilities of that membership. And may God Almighty bless us together as we seek to serve him. You may be seated. Robbie, I'd like to ask you to come on out here a minute. I'm going to just ask Robbie to share a little testimony with you this morning. Gives you a chance to get to know him a little more also. Um, Robbie, tell us a little bit about your faith background. How were you raised? What was your background in the faith? I was raised as a Catholic, and uh, I did that while I was in prison in 2006 through 2008. Okay. And what happened? I mean, you, you obviously got into trouble. You've told me that you've spent the majority of your life from age 16 to now. Yes. In prison. Yes. How did that happen? How did you get into that? How did, what caused you to get into this crime and violence and drugs and so forth? Well, while I was growing up, I used to be uh, abused as a child. And then I ended up starting to like getting hit. And then when I became a teenager, I tried to be a tough guy. And then I started using drugs so I could forget everything. And it went from using to selling. And I got caught at the age of 15 selling methamphetamines and went to prison for 11 years. So I, was, I came to Sheldon in 2001 on parole, went back to prison several times for the same charge. Okay. Now, you said a moment ago, I think I heard you say, I started enjoy, I mean, you were abused, and then you, I thought you said, I started to enjoy getting hit. What do you mean by that? Well, I kind of like, I started liking pain. It was the addiction I liked, that, you know, because I got an addictive personality, so I started becoming a very violent person, so it was more interesting for me. It was more interesting for you to get into fights and to have a little, yeah, a little to take house. a little as well as give it out. Huh. Um, so along the way, and here we are today, you're making a profession of faith in Jesus. What, what happened that turned you so that you're serious about turning to Jesus, so serious that you're making a profession of faith and joining the church? Well, I believe it was in December of 2010 or January of 2011. I was out on bond. I was facing some time for uh, delivery of... Uh, a possession of pot and 
a domestic, and I decided I needed some help. So one day out of the blue, it was pretty cold out, and I was walking. I knew I was going to prison, and I didn't want to leave the life I led anymore. So I walked up to Rob's uh, Rise Ministry building, and he was my landlord at the time. And I said, hey, Rob, you got a minute? talk to me and since then I've been on the right path praise the Lord um, can you give some specifics about what you've seen that since you said I've not since I talked to Rob and I started to um, be on the right path can you give some specifics of how your life has changed to you what's this right path what's changed right path is uh, for me I try to be Christ like I try to help people I used to be self centered it was all about me what I can get at, out of people and everything like that and just recently about a month ago I stopped doing my bible studies for like a week and I noticed my anger issues aroused and sure enough since I stopped doing that, I went to jail overnight for uh, arguing, and I got back on track, started doing my Bible studies, and been doing real good ever since. I see that if I, if I let myself not do the right thing by reading my Bible, reading my big book for alcohol analysis, I usually tend to fall backwards. You know what? That's really true in all of our lives. We just don't notice the fall back, perhaps as much as you do. If we get away from the Lord and get away from His Word and get away from personal prayer and that intimate relationship with the Lord, the same thing happens to us. We kind of fall back. We just don't notice it, maybe like you do. Um, and we've all got weaknesses. I mean, I, I have weaknesses. Um, we all do. Um, how, what are some of the weaknesses that you're going to have to continue to struggle with, to fight, that we need to pray about for you. We're going to support you. We want to pray that you stay strong. What areas are you going to have some struggles with? My major one is staying, staying clean and staying nonviolent. Those are my two major struggles. And that I need help more with my Bible studies. Okay. How long before you get out of the structure of RTF? I, th I believe it's October. October 1st or the 3rd. Okay. So, folks, we, we, we need to give Robbie our support always, but he's got structure, real structure in the sense of the RTF. They're very disciplined in what they expect of the residents there. But after that, you're getting more freedom. You're going to get up an apartment. Robbie is already working at Poet, um, so he's out most of the day, but then he's got to always go back at night. So, please remember this in your prayers. Um, and can you share anything with us? What do you need from us as a church to help you remain strong and true to Jesus? The support for uh, people start seeing me slip and to uh, confront me about it. Let, them, let me know I'm, I'm backpedaling. I kind of need help uh, finding a place to stay. He's giving you permission. His name is Robbie. If you see him in town and you wonder what's going on, he's giving you permission. Don't be afraid of this big guy. He, you know, a gentle giant that can become non-gentle. <laughs> but approach him if you are concerned. Give him your words of encouragement. Let's give him our support. All right? As I said, he's working uh, at Poet. He's got a good job. Uh, he, he loves to work. Uh, I, I just heard this morning that he wants to work seven days a week instead of six. And they said, no, you're going to work six days a week. But yeah. the seventh day, you're going to be right here with us. That's good. And uh, he's got a daughter. What's her name? Lily Jo. And how old is she? She will be four in June. Okay. And he loves her very much. He doesn't see much of her. So that weighs on his heart. And he, he needs that kind of support from us as well. Uh, just to pray for, for her. Um, Robbie... His hobbies are weightlifting. I met with him this week, and we talked a little bit about that. You know, all us men 
had those days when we weightlifted. And he said, yeah, I haven't been weightlifting since I was in jail. And he says, I went out and uh, I don't know where that was, if that was at the RTF or where. Courtyard. Courtyard, okay. And he sat down on the bench and he, he, he bench pressed two, 285. 285 without working out. So what's the most, we aren't even going to talk about what I've ever done. Um, his favorite verse, passage, is Psalm 119, 145 through 152. And as he read that to me this week, I can understand why that's his favorite verse. It talks about calling out to the Lord. And there are enemies all around me. And when you were in prison, that's, it's threatening in there. And there are enemies all around me, and I call out to you, and I ask you to deliver me and save me. And that's exactly what's happened. And I asked Robbie why he wants to become a part of First Reformed Church, and he said this, the members here accept me, they are friendly to me, the church does a lot to help people, it's not just about coming to church, and they do a lot for their youth. He has even shared his testimony with our youth group. So, He's got a friend that he comes to church with every Sunday. His friend comes with him. His name is Clarence. Clarence, we're glad to have you come too. Thank you for coming with, with Robbie that isn't to come alone. And uh, we're going to give you our love and support too. I hope you already feel it. Will you join me in a time of prayer? And can I have Robbie's family come on up and his best friend Clarence come on up and let's just gather around him and have a prayer. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful that you continue to work in the hearts and lives of people. And we're thankful that you have, through the circumstances of life, led Robbie to first reform the church, and, but most importantly, that you've drawn him to yourself. And Lord, we know, because we know ourselves, we all have weaknesses, things that we have to battle, and we know that he does too. So help us all. Fill us with your spirit. Give us what we stand in need of to stand strong for you. And if we slip, if we fall short, help us to remember that with you there's a grace. And we come to you and repent of our sin and turn to you, and we are forgiven and we have a clean slate. And we, I pray that that might not only be an encouragement to Robbie, uh, Clarence, to all the, the guys at the RTF, but to us as well. Lay your hand of blessing, your spirit upon him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Gary is also going to present Robbie with his membership certificate. And Rob's way in the back, but he's, he's up here in spirit, I'm sure. So, Hey, praise the Lord for this and this. Let's take a moment to stand and welcome and greet one another and remain standing for our worship. we are in Christ, the Bible tells us that we are a new creation. Our sins have been forgiven and our guilt has been wiped away, all because of Jesus. Oh 
we pray? Lord, we've seen the evidence of your grace this morning already. We've seen the evidence of your grace in the beautiful shower last night. We've seen the evidence of your grace in the lyrics of the songs we've sung and in the lives of people. And we thank you for that grace because we've needed it and we will continue to need it in the future. Lord God, we want to live lives that please you. But you know our weaknesses, and we do too. Continue to pour out your grace upon us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Ephesians says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in sin. It is by grace that you have been saved. Will you stand and sing with us?
seated. I invite you to open your Bibles this morning to the Gospel of John, chapter 6, and we will read together verses 25 through 40. This is Jesus speaking. This is the section where he describes himself as being the bread of life. Chapter 6, Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 25. When they found Jesus on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. You are not looking for me because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for this food that spoils, but rather for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him, What must we do? to do the works God requires. Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give us that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, It was not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven. It is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all that he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Let's pray together. Jesus, open our eyes to see. Open our ears to hear and understand. Open our hearts to receive. And soften our wills to surrender. We pray in Jesus' name. It's Labor Day 2013, another holiday weekend. This holiday weekend celebrating the American worker and the blessing of having a job. It is a blessing. And most Americans really do work hard. And I know that Iowans work hard. In fact, being from Iowa is a positive thing to have on your resume. I grew up in Iowa. Because I think people across the nation know that Iowans have been taught how to work. They've got a good work ethic. They know how to work. They can be depended upon. They're good workers. We know that hard work never hurt anybody. It's the way we provide for ourselves, our families, and for the kingdom work of the Lord. And when you think about it, we really spend an awful lot of time in our lives working. Now, in our passage of Scripture today, Jesus tells us that there's something more important than working for food. This more important thing is not getting a college education, though that's important. It's not getting married and having a family. That's important. That's good. It's not spending more time with our families and scheduling a wonderful family vacation. That's good also. It's not making a lot of money, investing it wisely so that we can look forward to the day when we can retire and not have to work anymore. That's good too. That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is referring to a different kind of work. Do not work 
for food that spoils, but work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. It is on him, the Son of Man, that God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So we're going to spend a couple moments now focusing on this work that Jesus encourages us, indeed commands us to do. But first he says, don't work for food that spoils. Do not work for food that spoils. And he understands that these people have followed him because they had gotten the kind of food that spoils. The context of what Jesus says here is that Jesus has fed 5,000 people miraculously with five small loaves of bread and two fish. And in verse 15 of this passage, the people are so impressed with this, they say, man, this guy needs to be our king. I mean, he feeds us miraculously. If he's our king, ever, all our needs will be met. So they're following him. They want to make him their king. Jesus sees through it. He says, you're not following me. I tell you the truth. You're not looking for me because you wonder who I am, where I came from, and why I'm here, and why I can do miraculous signs. You're following me because you ate earthly, physical bread, and your bellies were full. Don't work so hard for that kind of food. Now, he's certainly not saying don't work for a living, because in several passages, Ephesians 4, 28, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10, we're told we're supposed to work and take personal responsibilities for ourselves. But what Jesus means here is that he doesn't want us to get consumed by that kind of work. You know, harvest, uh, teaching, uh, uh, doing office work, he doesn't want us to get consumed with making the paycheck so that we can pay our house payments, car payments, and purchase our toys and enjoy our vacations and do some extra things and so forth. Don't focus on that. In fact, in, in a couple of other places, Jesus just flat out says it. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth. No, he's not saying don't have a savings account. He's not saying don't have a retirement account. He's saying don't focus on that and make that the focus of your life. He says, watch out. Be on your guard. You can get captured by that. That's a trap. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. It doesn't consist in the size of his savings account. It doesn't consist in the security that he has for retirement. Life is more than that. Now, that's all important, but don't get focused on that. Don't work for that. There was a rich nobleman who kept a jester for his amusement. And the jester was so entertaining through his silly actions and his foolish antics that the nobleman awarded him, rewarded him with a carved hardwood staff that had some precious jewels embedded in it. And as the years passed, the nobleman grew older. But he had always said to this jester, he had always told him, if you ever find a greater fool than yourself, jester, you give him your staff. It was his way of telling that jester he appreciated him. He was funny. He liked having him around. Well, the years passed, and the nobleman grew old and ill. The jester visited him to cheer him up, but the nobleman was lying in a bed, and the jester said to him, How are you doing, master? And the nobleman said, I'm dying. The jester asked, Where are you going? The nobleman said, To the next world. The jester asked, When will you return? The nobleman said, never. The jester asked, what provisions have you made for this journey? And the nobleman said, none. None at all. I haven't done anything to prepare for this journey. The jester was dumbfounded. He stood there for a moment saying nothing. And then he held his staff to the nobleman and said, here, master. I give you my staff, for with all my foolishness through the years, I have never been this foolish. 
He who provides for his life but takes no care for eternity may be wise for a moment, but he's a fool forever. Hey, this message is for us. We can get focused living in the United States of America where our lifestyle is so good, we can get focused on the good that that lifestyle gives us. Jesus said flat out, don't work so hard for that. You need to work. Yes, you need to take responsibility. You need to pay your bills. You need to provide an education for your children. But don't let that take control. Jesus said, work for that which endures to eternal life. What must we do to this, do this work? That was the question that I, that I asked him. What must we do to do the work that God requires? And Jesus answered it. The work of God is this. Believe. Believe in the one he sent. All our needs, all our greatest needs are met through a personal relationship with God's Son, Jesus Christ. And we need to work at that relationship. How hard do we work at a boyfriend-girlfriend relationship? We're always thinking. We're always uh, planning because we care about that relationship. How hard do we work at our relationship with Jesus Christ? The terms that are used here, Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. You people are following me because I fed you some bread, but I am the bread that really matters. You need to establish a relationship with me, and you need to work at it. It's a present imperative, that verb, work for food that endures to eternal life. It's a command. You've got no choice if you're a follower of Jesus. You've got to work at this, and it's present tense, which means today work at it, tomorrow, the next day. Present means now and into the future. The work of God is this, to believe. Again, it's a present tense. Believe now and into the future. What does that belief look like? It means that we come to Jesus in belief. It means that we look to Jesus in belief. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 31 through 33, don't worry about this other stuff in this world. Eating, drinking, clothes. Unbelieving people who have no God whatsoever, they're always running after this stuff, but you're different. You are different. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And everything else will take care of itself. So work at it. Work hard at it. Strive for it every single day, present and into the future. But understand this, that it's not just what we do. It's what God does in us. That's the wonderful part of being a Christian. We're not in this alone. It's not just our work alone. For we read in these verses... Jesus says, all that the Father gives me. See, God does something first. He gives people to Jesus. All that the Father gives me will come to me. I will lose none of all that he's given me. No one can come to me unless the Father gives him, draws him, calls him. God's in this with us. Our work and God's work. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 10, Paul says it this way, the grace of God, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked all the harder, but not I. The grace of God that is with me. Philippians 1, 6, God began a good work in us, and God will bring it to completion. Philippians 2, 13, work out your salvation. Work at it. But remember this. It is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good pleasure. So it's a partnership. It's like two rails of a train. You can't run a train with just one rail. You've got to have them both. My work, God's work, together we move forward. Don't work so hard at this world. It doesn't last. Make sure you work hard every single day at this relationship with Jesus Christ. So the work of the church of Jesus is twofold. Believing ourselves, believing in Jesus, and all that that entails, and then helping other people to believe. And the fact of the matter is that today is the day that we must do this work because there will come a time, Jesus said, night is coming when no one can work. 
now's our opportunity. You know, we're emphasizing this My Hope campaign. It's going to happen this year. It's going to happen in November. There's training going on. This is our opportunity. It's our time. We believe. Now we've got to learn how to encourage others to believe. Now is our opportunity. And it's the thing of first importance. There's nothing more important than this. So I have a choice. I have a choice to emphasize my own work, my career, my uh, paying my bills, my saving, my vacations, my uh, recreation, and this other work that is of first importance, my own faith, and being able to share that with others so that they have faith. How hard do you work at this? Well, I come to church. What more do you want? That's good. I'm glad. But coming to church can be mechanical. It's time, it's Sunday morning, it's an hour, and we're done. How hard do you work at it? Robbie can go to a bench and lift 285 pounds without working at it. Most of us can't do that. You're not going to live to lift 285 pounds without working at it. And you're not going to live a strong Christian life, and you're not going to lead anybody else to Christ if you don't work at it. It takes work. Bible reading, prayer, and worship, and service, and witnessing. Getting out into the trenches and doing it. Our custodian, Wally Waltheisen, will tell you that his job is never done. Cleans the bathrooms every Monday, and they have to be cleaned again the next Monday. He vacuums the carpet, they have to be vacuumed again every week. He uh, washes the windows, and every week they have to be washed again. On Sunday, everything looks great, but on Monday it has to be done all over again. His work is spoiled every single week. It never lasts. And that's the way it is with our work. Every year there's a harvest. Every Monday you go to the office or to the classroom or to work. But what we're doing there, though it is important, it doesn't last. The most important and satisfying work we can do in life is to believe in and follow Jesus and bring others to him. The best way for Christians to celebrate Labor Day is to remember this statement of Jesus Christ. My people do not work for food that spoils, but work for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. Let's pray. Thank you for our jobs, Lord. Thank you for providing for us. Thank you that we can pay our bills. Thank you that you put, in a, put us in a position of responsibility where we can take care of our obligations. We are thankful for that. But we hear your warning. Watch out. Be careful. Don't let us get entrapped by that. Help us to have right priorities. Teach us to focus every day upon this greater work that needs to be done in our lives and in the lives of others. We pray in Jesus' name. Please stand and join us as we sing about the great name of Jesus.
glad that you could be here to share it with us. Please take a moment to come on up here and uh, see this couple, to shake their hands, see their beautiful little baby girl, and to congratulate them, and also to shake Robbie's hand and give that big guy a hug too, okay? The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. 